Scripture says that Jesus was making his way from the north area in Galilee, up by Bethlehem and Capernaum and the Sea of the Galilee, down to Jerusalem. And as he traveled this route along, he came to the border between Galilee and Samaria. Now he chose to follow and travel through the boonies, the backwoods, and the rural villages. It would be something like um, going through Davisonville and Harwood and Lothian and Bowie on the way to Washington. Now at that time, many travelers would not go through this land. They would take a more easterly route down along the Jordan. But Jesus chose the riskier route through the villages of Galilee and Samaria, through the boonies where the ordinary folk and the other folk, you know, those folk that weren't of his tribe, that he didn't share the same culture with, that's where they lived. As he entered a village, ten men with a skin disease approached him. Now, now they kept their distance because that was the custom. That's what you had to do if you had a skin disease like leprosy. You wouldn't go near anyone. And yet they called out to Jesus and asked for mercy. Jesus, Master, show us mercy, they said. And when Jesus saw them, I mean he saw them, he really saw them, he saw their disease, he understood what it meant. He understood that they were outcasts, rejected by their church and their community because they were seen as contagiously sick and sinful. And he said, go and show yourself to the priests. Now, as they began to walk away, as they were still walking, their skin was cleansed. They were healed. One of them, a Samaritan, a foreigner, one of those who was considered like a dirty migrant, saw that he'd been healed. He recognized what had happened in that moment, that his skin had been clear, and he knew that it meant that he would be allowed to return to his family and to rejoin the workforce again. He knew that God was responsible for his healing. And so he returned. He went back to Jesus, praising God and thanking Jesus. Well, Jesus was under no obligation to heal those men. It was no benefit to him to heal them. But they asked, and he obliged. He graciously saw what they needed and generously gave it to him. This Sunday, many preachers will give a sermon on the attitude of gratitude. And that is a true message from the scripture. When we see what God has done for us, when we are aware of all the blessings in our lives and we turn towards God and pr with praise and thanksgiving, we become healthier, more whole. Or if you look at it from the other side, you turn it upside down, failing to say thank you, failing to express gratitude, coarsens us. It fosters a sense of entitlement, and we begin, begin to think that the world owes us. We become focused on what we don't have and folks will never have enough. The thought, that train of thought leads to unhappiness and anxiety and anger. It leads to dis-ease and disease. Also, not extending gratitude towards others lessens them. It makes them feel unappreciated, belittled, unseen, or invisible. Over time, ingratitude kills relationships and breaks people. So this is a story that teaches us about the wholeness that comes from gratitude. Get up and go, your faith has made you well, is what Jesus said. The man's acknowledgement of God's work and his response of gratitude has made him whole, an attitude of gratitude. As Christians, we are taught to be on the lookout for chances to see, say all those words of thanks and to express that thanks that constantly bubbles up in our hearts because of the many blessings that God has given us. 
And this is a story of healing. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He was crossing the border between Galilee and Samaria. He was passing through those boonies on his way to somewhere more important. And yet, he took time to graciously heal ten people. And so this story is undergirded with a call from Jesus for all disciples to keep on healing all people in all kinds of ways. Now, we often look to doctors, nurses, or EMT as healers because they are blessed with experience, skill, and keen awareness which enables them to be physical healers. But there are many sorts of brokenness. In this morning's story, Jesus' physical healing allowed the men to, to go before the priests and so they were restored into society and they were allowed to go home and be with family, and that had to be emotionally healing. They were allowed to re-enter the workforce, and that had to bring financial healing to their families. Jesus transformed the whole of, his, of their lives. Each of us also has life experience and a variety of skills, and the keen awareness to say, see where our gifts can be used to bring healing. For example, in Edgewater Elementary School, they have been blessed with a large, diverse kindergarten class. In fact, they have six classes of kindergarten students, 20 students in each class. And that's drawing from that whole Edgewater neighborhood. And so, Many of those students are not ready for school. You know, back in the day, you went to kindergarten to learn your ABCs. But nowadays, because some people get to go to preschool, they want the children to already know their letters before they enter kindergarten. And in Edgewater, they don't. There are people in our congregation that could volunteer to help these students learn their letters. They could volunteer to heal that learning gap so that all children had an equal chance to learn to read. There is a blood shortage in our region. This means that much of the electric uh, um, elective surgery will be postponed. And some patients, like those with leukemia, will have to go for longer times between their treatments. The Red Cross is going to be here on Tuesday the 25th from 1.30 to 7, but some of us know that we could donate blood even before that date. Or consider what Hurricane Matthew has done. It has devastated Haiti. 500 people have already died there. And then it swept across the Barbados and up along the coast, the eastern coast of the U.S. Did you know that the United Methodist Committee on Relief is already in response, already at work? They have a presence in Haiti, and so they've been able to use their stockpile of emergency supplies and food and health kits to relieve suffering there. And they're in mission with the Bahamas Methodist Habitat Organization, bringing healing there. And Methodists all along that eastern coast are prepared to go and bring relief. But the financial outlay for Haiti alone is going to be $150,000. We can't all go there to help them muck out, but there are ways that we can support. So I've posted a link on our Facebook site for any of you who would like to contribute to the healing work of UNCOR. Over the next several months, our church is going to bring healing to our neighbors through Operation Christmas Child and the Thanksgiving Baskets. 
and toiletries and lunches for the homeless, and the Christ child gifts, and the wreaths across America. We are a congregation that is powerfully engaged in many missions. We have many opportunities to share our gifts to heal others. And through our work, God also transforms lives. When we pay a bill that keeps the lights on in someone's home, well, then their house is lit up. But we also light up their heart. We spark wonder. We shed light on what it means to be Christian. When others see us as people who are knowing, loving, and serving God, they see us as behaving as Christ, and, and they become curious about that. What, what motivates us? How can we do what we do? How can we, out of what looks like ordinary life, give so much? And so they listen to our stories of faith. They hear about the love of Christ that grounds us. They hear about the spirit that pushes out the fear from our heart and fills us with a trust that allows us to step out in service. And they begin to understand that we are part of God's plan for them. And that they are part of God's plan for us. Yeah, yeah. They are part of God's plan for us. We are changed too. The more that we realize that we're part of God's plan, the more that we learn to trust, and then the more that the Spirit fills our heart, and, and that helps us give more, and, and then the more that we give, the more that we realize that we're part of God's plan. And this circle of God's grace given and received with gratitude and given away again, in that circle we learn generosity. Sometimes that circle of grace works really quickly. We reach out with bread and the bread of life, Christ. And we change the circumstances for someone and they are changed and they are grateful and they return that blessing. Just like the men who returned to Jesus with praise and thanksgiving, we see the change in gratitude in them immediately. But more often than not, they'll be a polite thank you and they'll go on their way. And we'll never really know the difference that we made, whether it was inside or out. Jesus healed ten people, but only one came back to praise God and thank Him. The other nine, we can assume, carried on to see the priests. They did what Jesus told them to. Maybe they expressed their praise and thanksgiving just before they closed their eyes that night and said their prayers. We don't really know. But... Look at what Jesus did. He continued to heal. Story after story, village after village, we hear of him going and healing, whether or not people said thank you. We have to keep on going and giving. Each of us continues to know and serve God. Generosity will grow in us and around us. And when we live into the last part of our congregation, motto, knowing, loving, and serving God in unity, God can work even more powerfully. Because none of us have all the skills and all the, that's needed to heal every kind of brokenness. But together, together we can do a lot more. Now, think about the yard sale yesterday. If I I take it all that I donated to the yard sale, and I tried to sell it in my own yard sale. I would have sold some of it, and I would have some money that I could turn around and relieve at least one person's suffering, well, at least partially, right? But if I give all my stuff to the church and you give all your stuff to the church, then the news travels widely that, oh, there's an awesome yard sale at Davis Civil United Methodist Church, and more people come, and more stuff is sold, then we can help many families and relieve much suffering. And what we don't sell goes on to AMVETS and becomes part of their mission of healing. God's circle of grace grows broadly. It heals more wild, widely. 
and we had fun. As we work in unity, we draw closer to each other, and we, in that way we draw closer to God. I can't imagine not being part of a church and a congregation. This morning's scripture reading shows us the health and wholeness that comes from an attitude of gratitude, and it sets before us an example of generous healing. Giving helps us become what God wants us to be, grateful and generous healers. God uses our giving to change the world for God's purposes and to change us. Amen.